The Date That Never Was, Lessons on Self-Betrayal and Why You Love the Colonizer. The Date That Never Was, this breakthrough came at a speed bump of a familiar inroad going round and round as you run yourself into the ground, breaking open and through layers of scar tissue, the settling for the pain you always knew, saying yes when you should say no, your house built in survival. It was this, it was as if, it was as if the planets collided and the earth opened up. Why is self-betrayal always the first cup? I'll serve it myself if I must be poisoned. It will be by my hand, conditioned by a society that loves it when a man silences me, shaming me for being wild, wanting to possess me and my soul, controlling, contorting. Is this my final resting place? I almost died by the hands that were not mine, the audacity, the tenacity to veil me away, kill whatever is left in me. My fight, my resistance threatens his existence because his house is built on sand. And he is empty, starving for life that can only be gathered by sucking on my neck. Who are you? You are who? The one who reminds me that being wild threatens the status quo. So teach me to be palatable to the dominant culture, not to stir the pot and don't make the air dense with grief. We like the make be live. We like to measure our lives by the metrics that you set because you know we will never arrive. We are under a spell. You don't want me to remind you of what it could be to taste the nectar of liberation that will open up for you possibility. Don't be like the zombies settling for secondhand clothes and masks that can strike a pose, forgetting who you are and bringing food and with a smile to the potluck. <laughs> The ahs and ahs, this Puerto Rican food tastes good. Did you renew your passport? Your English is very good. Oh, the accomplishment of being professional and sounding legit. What a prize for the one who has internalized that truly your people are savage and have no manners that they serve at the pleasure of white power. You'll prove them wrong and speak their language and the revolution and evolution boiling in your blood will soon run dry. Settle, settle for the one who treats you like you are none, betray, Betray yourself for there is nothing more. And in the moment of the darkest hour, the sun rose in its power. The moon witnessed you through the window. The trees whispered, it is time to be born anew. Break the shackles, release the patterns, settle no more for this is your hour. No, I am good, thank you. No, thank you. I will not be microaggressed for that transgression that you thought were a matter of profession is the mask of colonization that will be your end. It is in this portal that I beheld a vision. I will no longer settle for sleepwalkers nor agents of imperialism. I will no longer settle for a man who submits to his position as the carrier of oppression that seeks to create depression so that he can seem glorious. Your crown is made of lies. I am not only your equal, but hold my own ground. I will draw my sword in battle next to you. And if we die, we shall come back again and be the revolution hand in hand. And I on the mountain have declared my own name, willing to stake my own claim to lead my people to their freedom. For they not own another drop of blood will shed, nor betray the self and settle for death. This is a poem by our panelist, Kahanet Ya. Let's get these panelists up here and uh, let you meet them. Kohenet Ya, Hebrew priestess of liberation, of liberation, Drew Yorkin heritage, exploring what it means to truly decolonize ourselves, our workplaces, and our practice of growing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Kohonet Ya brings 25 plus years of experience supporting people and reclaiming their heart, magic, and sovereignty. As a self-described Jew Yorkin, 
New York Jewish and Puerto Rican poet. She reads words in Jewish liturgy with multi-dimensional frequencies that support our embodied complexities and erotic necessities. Kohanet, that poem that I just read of yours, can you talk to us about uh, where, where were you? What, what, what was spilling out of you at the time of penning those <laughs> words? Yeah, um, it, <laughs> it literally happened to uh, be inspired by a date that never happened. <laughs> and it was somewhere in a conversation with the guy that um, we came at an impasse of understanding sexism and its historical roots. Um, and it just, by the end of that night, I also had done a workshop around um, identity and around, you know, um, the idea of diversity and what it means to really have a critical analysis. And by the end of the night, those two conversations clashed. Um, and, <laughs> and when they did, this is kind of what poured out because it was the, the, the tension of what happens when we're not looking at the internalized aspects of oppression and what happens in our own liberation and the longing for that. Um, it's also like a radical declaration of not settling for what in the beginning almost innocuously can seem like something that's beneficial, but it's not. Uh, mm. And so uh, by the by the end of the by the end of the night, this poem was kind of boiling inside of me, and I was like, "Uh huh," kind of how I, I'm like, "Gotcha," and just poured it out. So that's some of the inspiration behind that. Just this idea of like, wait a minute, we talk about a thing, but the embodiment is much more complex, um, yes. you know, and that owning the internalized stuff it requires courage to yeah. name it and set, a, set it as a president. Well, actually, we're not gonna do that anymore. I'm good, yeah. no thank you, <laughs> no thank you. So yeah, thank, thank you for reading that. I, that was amazing. I really appreciate it and, and yeah, thank you. Well, I felt we needed to start, you know, we're, we're in a place that um, to talk about decolonization of our minds, our hearts, our bodies, and and our land, and our workplaces, and our homes, and etc. We couldn't start in regular panel uh, meeting space, right? Because then we would just be. <laughs> uh, uh, and yet, I think, you know, reading your words, it it really captured immediately. If we're going to talk about unlearning colonialism, unlearning uh, colonization of our bodies, of our lands, of our our, our our thoughts, our words, and etc., that piece captures so much the tension of trying to go along to get along. This is. This is right. what we've been raised in. This is what we've been nurtured in. This is what we've suckled from, from our earliest moments, while also knowing something about it is wrong and off. Right. Yeah. Can you say more about that? Yeah. So one of the things about the work that I do and, and the place of most, I just want to double check the mic. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Much better. Perfect. Thank you. Um, it, there's a part of my work that involves a, a heavy look at uh, the idea. So there's this study of trauma-informed care, right? Communal care, et cetera. And then there's liberation psychology. There's this piece of what, like, more further than the checklist, how we're actually engaging in this. And one of the pieces that I've discovered over time that made me hungry and I was looking for was the conversation around ongoing trauma, which racism, sexism, all the isms fall underneath that umbrella. But it's not addressed as much as we would event trauma or some sort of big collective trauma. Mm. And part of the our, our conditioning that demands of us to desire more than anything to be to be approved of, to be considered as 
has us in these cycles that are actually bypassing and gaslighting to ourselves Mm. in terms of the cost of having to navigate these worlds. And so the tension of it has more impact than folks are imagining. And that's where a lot of this, like, I'm very like determined to have conversations about the idea that the messenger is often experiencing a, an extraordinary amount of pain and microaggressions and re-triggering because they're entering a zone in which what is demanded of them is not even their own. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so this is this comes out of doing years and years of trainings and watching the dynamics, watching the attempts at the interface between liberation and organizations and or institutions, what we think is the thing that'll solve the problem versus what the problem actually is, right? And so for me, there's these worlds that I'm constantly moving in both for myself and when I'm teaching or training that I'm observing this tension that it's like an elephant in the room. We're not naming it, but it lives with us everywhere we go, constantly negotiating for who we are in the presence of something else, which is a reaction, not a response. Yeah. Right. And that to truly be embodied is to embody the complexities that come with it, to be able to look at the shadow of something and say, I'm showing up professionally. This is what I want to do, but I have to cross all these T's and dot all these I's. And the way it impacts me is because half of it I don't believe in, Mm -hmm. but I still must show up. Right. And so for me, there's this piece about being able, and, and it's my honor to be here, being able to talk about what it actually means and to look at decolonization and colonization as the root place so that then we know what are the things and the tools that we're going to need to equip ourselves for the long journey, if you will. And so that's where a lot of this comes because I remember in even my beginning of doing anti-racism work, I, I inherited a lot of the conversations or the tropes around what is accessible, how things land, not trying to offend, realizing that that often put me at odds with my own passion, calling and community and the things that I, we needed to talk about. I'm not going to be able to do that without somebody getting offended. And if you're getting offended, then we're going to work on your capacity to build for the tension because the prioritization and the centralization, what's most important needs to be the communities impacted by the marginalization and or the oppressive structure. So, so this is like after spending years and years of going, there's something wrong with DEI work. There's something off. There's something off how as a, a new Eurekan, my first conditioning. So I'm first generation. My mom and my grandmother were born on the island, Puerto Rico, Borinquen, original, right? And the way we were taught and conditioned to show up, suppress the places mm. that are screaming or in pain in order to appear that we're okay and we can handle this in a much more regulated state, which actually doesn't make sense. Right? Yeah. Like we're doing a lot in the back end in order to even exist and interface on this in this dimension. And so for yeah. me, these conversations are really important um, because there's a lot that we need to name and there's a lot that we need to consider in what we're saying is actually the work. Yes, yes. <laughs> 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 okay <laughs> put your seat belts on everybody you see where we're going to go today i mean uh did everybody just write that down because you're going to need to meditate on it big time later you are gaslighting even yourself yeah let's welcome up to the stage um adria mcmichael founder of job swiper and uh her tech startup, Job Swiper, believes that every seat at the board table can and should be filled with traditionally targeted people, traditionally excluded people who are not traditionally seen in the technology ecosystem. Uh, Adria grew up with a mother from the Standing Rock CEO tribe. The cornerstone to her company and to her belief system is that Black and Indigenous folks can change the way we do business and that creating ecosystems of humans that are neurodivergent, black and indigenous, communal, and taking into practice, into being that next seven generations 
mindset, that thinking, that philosophy, that practice. Adrian, you've talked uh, to me about this before, about that um, both having grown up with a very strong connection to your uh, familial stories, your familiar culture, your Standing Rock Sayo tribe, and the journey of being neurodivergent in a world that still teaches the failed concept of neurotypical, uh, that you often feel as though you're masking. You're, you're on the, the sidelines trying to figure out which character to play in which context. How does that map to this conversation around decolonization, around uh, colonialism? I'm just, I'm just leaning in. I'm ready. <laughs> so there's there's just a lot. And I, I think um, another thing to know is that um, I was just diagnosed as neurodivergent just, you know, a couple of years ago. And so it's really understanding how, one, um, we don't really have these conversations within our communities about what it means to be neurodivergent and um, how that could actually be part of the colonization process you know that this is just one more thing that makes you different so it's better if you mask it um mm. or if you show up to these places and you put on the best show um you become the most agreeable you know form of who you are uh because otherwise people won't like you and um you know like we were just saying you know they they will feel uncomfortable and um you can't have that so um <laughs> and and yeah, I've been masking since I was little because uh, that's what we were taught. One of my friends is here um, and she grew up with me in Germany. We were both, her parents were stationed there. And so, you know, even within the military culture, you were taught to mask um, and to mm -hmm. not stand out and to not um, make people very uncomfortable by being your wonderful, very, very different self. Um, and you know, also being a woman growing up in that culture could could be it is it is it is very colonized. Um, so yeah, I um, I recognized a long time ago that uh, I became good at masking, and um, I thought for a long time it was because of this military culture thing that you know, we're, we're going to move in a few years. So you have to be agreeable. You have to be liked in the new place that you go to. But what I was doing was teaching myself how to mask my neurodivergence and also to mask like, you know, my family's culture. Um, both my parents um, um, have uh, views that come from our communities, views that come from our culture, um, you know, belief systems that come from our culture, but are definitely not Christian, definitely not, you know, seen as palatable, seen as, um, you know, maybe even a little oh, demonic or something, you know, like you can't even say the things that um, you would normally say around your grandmother um, in these cultures, in this, in this culture. Wow. Right now. So, um, yeah. yeah, I just, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I have so much to say about it, but again, with the ADHD, it's, it's like, I need to stay on track with that. But that's, that's the other part of it is that that's normal communication, going off track, going in a circle, going up on a spiral is part of communicating and part of learning about who you are. And we definitely don't want that, right? Like, it's definitely not okay. So in other spaces, oh, here, here, yeah, here please yeah. let us remember. <laughs> Yeah, we, yeah, you know, we got our glass of wine and our canapes. Let's let's yeah. let's go in the circle. Yeah, yeah, I love yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, let's introduce uh, Rosalia, uh, Professor Rosalia Hamilton, uh, so that we can get to the circling. Uh, Professor Hamilton is the founding director of the Institute of Law and Economics in Jamaica. She's the coordinator with the Advocacy Network, a key group pushing for Republic Republicanism in Jamaica. Professor Hamilton has taught at graduate and undergraduate levels in Jamaica and the United States of America, and a special advisor and trade policy consultant in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, as well as chief advisor to the Prime Minister of Jamaica. 
Professor Hamilton, can you uh, start off by kind of giving us a, what is a very, um, somebody out there is really hungry for an academic definition of colonialism and decolonization. Like if we needed to give, you know, the more, 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 how would I define that? What What's the main thought or thinking there? Well, I think whatever the definitions we look at, we're, we're looking at a process that mm. dehumanizes, a process that um, of, 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 of belittling, a process of uh, domination and oppression, um, you know, and, and there it, it takes different forms. I mean, we've had the experience that led to genocide, you know, um, of a people. So you, there are many different types of ways to define the, the, the concept, but I think those are some of the key elements and the process of decolonization, I think, is a conversation about um, humanization, is about, you know, redefining oneself outside of um, that kind of colonial definition and a process in which we, people are free to pursue their own self-interest. So self-determination are key concepts as well in this process of um, decolonization. Yes. But Professor Hamilton, what if I go uh, just, you know, oh, that was so long ago. Like, uh, what are we still talking about? That was so long ago. What are we going to do? Just like, you know, leave the land? Like, uh, what do we say? Yeah. To the yeah. It's, 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 it's still, it's such a good point because I think um part of the difficulty is that link between the past and the present. Mm. And this is something that we've been doing in a very conscious way here in Jamaica, because, for example, there's some recent issues having to do with land ownership and squatting in Jamaica. Um, and, you know, we've just seen another incident of the government literally demolishing homes and, you know, people are illegally on land. But if you look at our history, we had a, city, a history in which land was stolen from the indigenous people. And you had um, the simple, you know, taking of plots and large tracts of land by one set of people, the oppressors and the colonizers, and the landlessness of the vast majority. And so since emancipation and independence, there has been no deliberate um, strategy and policy to rectify that wrong. And so today in Jamaica, 20% of our population, we're talking about over half a million people, are quote unquote squatters. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they don't own land. And, and, it, it, and it's a problem. So we have that issue and it manifests as, as a, it's, it's, if you Google Jamaica, you know, landlessness, um, squatting and so on. You see there are contemporary issues like last week. I mean, a few weeks ago, there are issues of people who have set up, you know, temporary housing and so on. They're trying to find somewhere to live. And they're, the, so these issues linger on. We have persistent issues with respect to, for example, hair discrimination in our schools. Our kids are being taught how to carry their hair. And the discrimination we see are mainly focused on African hair. And so mm -hmm. concepts of self still linger. Um, you know, lighter skin is better than darker skin. Um, straighter hair is better. So that those, those concepts of self are real. And it's not just self con concepts, but it's also social response because you may be proud of who you are and you're black, but the society doesn't quite see you that way. And so your friends and family and so on treat you differently. So, you know, those are just, um, just two of many lingering um, colonial legacies that we have to root out um, of our society. Wow. Wow. Uh, let's invite uh, Kohet Naya and Adria up and let's uh, really uh, get circle-y here because um, 
you know, uh, Kohnet, yeah, if I say, well, but, you know, I went out and I bought a, um, I'm decolonizing my mind sweatshirt. It, is that what you mean by I need to be thinking about reclaiming my body? Or I have a sign in my front yard that says, it, and so I'm giving my land back by putting this sign here. Is that what you're referring to? Is it much more than that? <laughs> There's so much temptation as a New Yorker. <laughs> you can tell I'm from the Northeast as well. Yes. You know, it's just like, I'm so happy you got a t-shirt. I'm I'm glad for you. Um, but no, uh, <laughs> the, the t-shirt won't quite cut it. Although sensationalism and trends are a thing. It's mm. the substance of actually internalizing and, and dealing with and toiling with the tension that what we have created as in our particular context, an American ideal is actually not. And mm -hmm. to step into the dream world that we created as a result of the structures is a tension that you can tell when somebody's inside of that space because there's a way that it deflates <laughs> your most uh, heroic appearance of a being a change agent because you have to toil with the way that you're colluding with the very structures that are seeking to subjugate you, right? So a sign on the, on the manicured lawn that has been sprayed a thousand times won't quite cut it in terms of the folks that were called to steward this particular land, Turtle Island that we live on. And so some of those more like, I mean, I, you know, shirts are beautiful, <laughs> signs are great. And that may be a, a tiny piece, but if the embodiment and the substance of that critical analysis is not there, we're missing huge aspects of it. And so for me, when I'm, when I'm talking about this, I I'm holding the tension between where we're actually at and where we're trying to go without, and, to, uh, and I love what you said, Dr. Hamilton, because it is about the humanization. It is mm -hmm. about coming back to the place that I get to remember. I get to, I get as a Puerto Rican descendant, as a Puerto Rican descendant, I get to oust out of myself the labels, the assignments that another culture gave me and own the complexity and the intersectionality of my own without needing to, to drag it down or minimize it or shrink it so it's palatable. And this is decolonizing. It's not just like this theory that happens that it sounds great. It's more than that. And you, there's times where it's hard to understand because most folks don't know who they are or where they come from. Mm. You, you can't understand the fight if you don't know what we're fighting for. Right. And so it's one of those things. Again, T-shirts are great, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about auditing your entire life for mm. all the ways in which it's colluding with the very oppression and the very dominant culture that we're actually impacted mostly by, right? So for me, it's part of that, like, no, there's nothing easy about this conversation. I mean, we can talk about unicorns and rainbows. I'm not sure where exactly we're gonna, all going to find it, right? Because we're all in the active work of, mm. but I believe in our capacity to hold the tension, and at any rate, when we're together, we are going to co-build that capacity because we can't bypass the stuff anymore. We can't gaslight ourselves into thinking that the things are working when they're not working, when we're still having the same conversation in 2022 around Black and brown lives that we had in the early 1900s. There's something wrong with the picture. And so for me, having such a connective, like when I look at Puerto Rico right now, I Evidence, the, the islands are very, uh, the Caribbean is a very solid place to look at colonization at different stages. Mm. And this is what I love about Pokalini's work uh, from Hawaii, where they talk about the stages of decolonization, what it looks like to do that. That first, I need to remember who I am, remember my ancestors, remember all the pieces, why we left, why we ran. And when I'm able to face those things within myself, I'm able to honor what's most important as I show up. And that creates an acuteness that sometimes feels like tension for some people. So they run in the other direction, right? So yes, those are yes. kind of my, my thoughts around that. I mean, you're even <laughs> reminding me of a conversation uh, we had a few months ago with Joy 
Donnell uh, talking about why that representation in film and television and story becomes so important because uh, to remember where one comes from and to uh, bask in it, to find joy in those stories and those histories is a part of that. Oh, those, those are my people. Those might be my right. people. And it's everything from Woman King, you know, for me, yes. uh, Woman King to be able to go like, I look like her on the right. Did I yes. go out and get a spear? Absolutely. Will I use it? Maybe. I don't know. Depends. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but right. To be able to go like, yeah. oh, I might come from there. And right. it's beautiful and it's rich and it's contextual. And when I think about, you know, if we look at uh, within uh, our media in this country and we look at the depictions of uh, the uh, indigenous uh, cultures, the original owners of this land here, and that infantilization, that servant role, that uh, bumbling idiot, right? And still mm -hmm. so many of us, that is the image that exists in our head. That right. is the image of the person carrying the turkey on Thanksgiving Day to say, yes, thank you for coming right. and stealing my land and giving us smallpox, right? Right, right. Professor Hamilton, what has been the process in Jamaica right now as you all are very much as a country involved in this work? Well, you know, we, since the royal visit earlier this year, um, you know, the I'm part of a advocates network and we are actually in our day to day lives. The work we do is to deal with some of these social and economic legacies of colonization. And we're very clear that these problems, contemporary problems we're facing is linked to the institutional retention of these colonial norms and habits and so on. And so we felt very strongly when the royals came in the midst of COVID that this was not appropriate. Um, this is not business as usual. We are about to celebrate our 60th year at the time. Um, that was in August. We, we, we celebrate 60 years of independence. And we wanted not only the royals, but we wanted Jamaicans to mm. be reminded of our history, where we're coming from. And so we, you know, staged a protest, we did an open letter, and we clarified our position that, you know, we, we see nothing to celebrate of the Queen's 70th Jubilee. And, um, you know, the 60 years was a 60 years of trying to grow up from a process of 800, 528 years of Spanish and British mm -hmm. colonial domination. And so... We wanted to remind persons about that, and we did 60 reasons for an apology and reparations and so on. But what we felt coming out of that is that we need to push harder as a people in Jamaica to create a republic. You know, both political parties have been talking about this for decades. Um, it's in their political manifestos that they will remove the monarch as head of state. Um, we feel, though, that it's not just enough to move the monarch. We also need to create a state in which the people are sovereign. And so mm. our conversation, and as we push towards, um, you know, removing the monarch, we, we embrace a broader decolonization agenda in which we move to create a set of policies, a legal framework in which the people of Jamaica become sovereign. And as part of that, begin and I shouldn't say begin, but continue and intensify this conversation that we've had long had about the legacies of the colonial process and how we must put an end to them. Yeah, yeah. Because we're in the we're in the safe space. We're at, we're at home. Just you know, uh, from your vantage point in Jamaica right now, you're coaching the United States of America through its decolonization process. What would be your big sisterly advice? <laughs> um, you know, let, let's start with the dialogue, you know, start with deepening an understanding of the process. You know, they're not just one set of victims, you know, we're all quote unquote victims of a uh, system that only benefited a few. 
um, um, whichever side of the fence you sit, the legacies impact you. Mm -hmm. And I think that the more we begin to understand that enduring legacy, the more we can find ways to resolve the problems. Because you, you made a point, and it's a, it's a point a lot of people say, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's in the past, you know, let's forget it and move on. You know, how, how do we, we can't fix that. We, we can fix the enduring legacy. Racism ought not to exist in the way we see it manifest in our day-to-day -day lives in 2022. It ought not to exist. We ought to have learned that that way in which we treat each other as humans is not good enough. We need yeah. to do better. And so I think the conversations are, is an important starting point where we begin to relearn our history because we now understand that the history we're taught was not only a bag of lies and a distortion of the truth, but also very damaging to the psyche of our people. Mm. And I would say to a uh, psyche for all of us, because there was a sanitized version that made some people feel good about the past. And, and there's another very horrific version that made others feel very bad about the past. And, you know, many of us don't want to go back there because it's too emotional. It's too painful. Mm. And while it is, and I feel the pain as I engage this conversation and dialogue. I do it with hope and optimism that as human beings, we have the capacity to understand each other, to create a world in the words of our um, you know, most prolific advocate, Bob Marley, in which we, you know, um, we put an end to the philosophy that makes one man superior and another inferior. And we put, we finally and permanently put an end to that system, you know, where we can create a world in which, you know, we, we all can, you know, coexist and there's no, you know, first class and second class citizens. You know, that's that's the dream. And I, I believe it is possible. I am optimistic and I begin. I think that the kinds of conversations we're having here today and other kinds of dialogue begin to push us in this direction of a different world, a world yeah. that's free of racism and free of the scale and nature of oppression that we still see today as legacies of the past. Yes, yes. And you're reminding me of uh, our panelists a couple months ago, um, Leticia Nieto, talking about that uh, similar, I think, uh, as you were talking about the journey of decolonization of one's mind, similarly on the allyship journey, that you actually become more hopeful, not less. And that uh, for the skeptic, sitting in the room right now, skepticism as um, Professor, oh, I can't think of his name right now, I'll remember in a minute, but skepticism <laughs> is the vantage point of somebody sitting on the sidelines. If you're in the work, you move past skepticism to participation and participation breeds hopefulness. Adria, can you, Somebody today really needs to hear about the process of doing this personal healing of unplugging from the colonial teachings that have taught us to gaslight ourselves, to even hate ourselves, to hate our hair, to hate our cheeks, to hate our lips, to hate our bodies. What has your process been like? Um. Therapy helps for sure. Uh, <laughs> I found a, a black woman therapist that specializes in workplace race-based trauma specifically. Mm. And um, I see her pretty regularly. Um, and it was really having someone who understands brains telling me that my brain was fine. I didn't imagine anything um, that all of these things did happen. And um, you know, 
being in the tech world, being native, being black in the tech world um, is an awful thing. And um, none of my experiences uh, were not real. And mm. that I, I needed other people to know that. I needed other people to recognize that. Um, and it, and, you know, it happened with someone that wasn't a therapist for sure. You know, people would be like, oh my God, when I would tell them my stories, like, girl, are you okay? And I'm like, huh, you know, I'm not, <laughs> that's a really good point. <laughs> I'm really not okay. And it would just, because we, we, a part of the decolonization process was me understanding that none of that was okay. Mm. Uh, that all of that was abuse. Um, that if, any of the things that had happened to me at work happened, and we talked about this before, you know, if they had happened within a relationship, like a, a friendship or your partner, um, all your friends would be like, uh, mm, you're in danger, you know, <laughs> like you are in real danger here. Like that, that way that people still can treat you at work versus the rest of the world, yeah, we call out racism all the time now. It's like on TikTok, it's really, we do it, we, we take people down, but then when we're at work, it's like that one last place that people can be abusive to you and get away with it and have the support of an HR team, you know, like have like all of the support um, behind it. So part of healing was identifying that there's still places that can and will come for you and, um, how do we change that? It was really, it was really understanding that we have to change it, that uh, we have to recognize it, that this is not fun. We were just talking about how, um, you know, this individualist society that we are in, I mean, it's, it's straight up narcissism 101 and we reward it. Um, mm. And in our communities, traditionally, that would not have been rewarded. You know, we talk, I talked to my aunt, I was just back um, at Standing Rock and I was talking to my aunt about that. And it's just like, yeah, before, before settlers, before colonization, if somebody acted like that, like that toxic, that me first, like I, I'm the best at this and you all suck, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. like that, that kind of attitude, to get you banished. Like it, if you don't fix that, it's not, it's not a good thing. It's not something to be rewarded. You don't become a billionaire because of it. Mm. And um, we have to change that because the, I mean, it's literally in every workplace. It's not just tech. It's not just tech. And you would think, and I, I bring up tech because people think, oh, it's new progressive. Like everybody's super, all of the startups are super cool and they give you like free lunches and stuff. And like, <laughs> yeah, it's so fun. Um, yeah, no, it's the worst still. Um, mm. And it's not just, you know, the blue collar workers are not just the ones that are still racist. It's not, or misogynist or whatever. It is in every sphere of our society. And the one place where it is absolutely still almost sought after as a personality is the workplace because it's going to get you promoted. You know, it is absolutely like not being brown and masking all the time will get you promoted. We know that. Every single one of us knows that. And that has to, that's why, I mean, that's why you're doing what you're doing, right? That's why I'm doing what I'm doing because I'm, frankly, we're all sick of it, right? And mm. I know I know that when I talk about like my dream of seeing a boardroom that's filled with people that look like me, it's not even because of it. It's because I know we exist. I know that there, I've met so many smart, yeah. incredible black indigenous people who would kill at this, who would do so well at this because of our ideas of what community is, of our ideas of what success looks like. You know, and I'm hoping that the more we do have these conversations, the more that companies have these conversations, the more they change the way that success looks like, that that is going to spread as sort of an antidote, you know, to the toxicity that is racism. I just see it as a poison, you know, 
when we talked about how evil it is, it's, it's poison and it just kept spreading and spreading and spreading. And I think that these conversations are part of the antidote and with actions too. Like we're talking, thank you for telling me what land you live on. I really appreciate, what do you do though? You know, like, you know, where you occupy, whose land you occupy, but what do you do to, to make sure that the people that are from that land get it back to steward because that's what's important to us. So can you say uh, uh, you've used this language and can you define that for everyone on the call? What is uh, to steward? What does that mean? <laughs> we, um, I really hope that I don't go off on this <laughs> because it can be very simple that the indigenous people that were on the land before colonization happened had a relationship with this land um, that sustained everyone. And we were able to give back to the land. And speaking of circular, you know, this, this was a way of us to live within our means, within the land. And we did it well without having to, quite frankly, like raise everything to the ground, which is kind of the way that colonizers see land stewardship. It's not like that. And so you know, whether I'm in the Pacific Northwest, you know, whether that's our relationship to the salmon runs um, or, um, you know, when I'm back in North Dakota, we understand um, uh, my, uh, I think I told you guys about my, my cousin who runs with the, um, runs the bison or the, the buffalo on our reservation. So like bringing those populations back and, and we still utilize, you know, our food, our land, everything in a way that makes sure that everybody is fed, that everybody is living a bountiful life. You know, we can do that, but it has to come back from an indigenous point of view because we already know that, we already know that relationship. So I hope that makes sense because <laughs> it's such an important, the land back concept is such an important part of decolonization um, that we, we know how to live with the land around us. And we know how to fix the problems that we're having right now, whether it's environmental or not, we know how to do that. We've been doing that for millennia. So just giving us the opportunity to come back to our own land and fix it, that's the land back movement, that's it. We, we can do that. Just, you know, you got to ask. That's my dog. I'm sorry if you guys. Thank you, dog. Your dog study was like, I feel that, mama. And just, yes, you know. He had to get yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, you see, if I'm, can I yeah. just jump in and just yeah. underscore what Adria just said? Because, you know, for us in the Caribbean, um, you know, climate change is real. And the connection to the land and the kinds of steps that we now must urgently take. This is an existential conversation. And there's a lot to learn from what our indigenous people did and how they cared for the land. And this idea that we're interconnected as human beings is key, not just to each other as a philosophy, that Ubuntu philosophy, um, yeah. But we're also interconnected with the land, with nature. And I think that point is such an important point. I just wanted to underscore that. Yes, yes. I mean, it's so interesting. Uh, I, I love whenever people, they're like, oh, this is a kind of a woo-woo idea. And I'm like, you're probably anything that you consider to be a woo-woo idea is old knowledge that pretty much was spread out around the world until it was colonized by a very singular type of knowledge. And this idea of this interconnectedness that uh, part of what makes this space that we hold together so amazing is that we are not distal to one another. We are looking at one another through this, you know, innovation right now, this type of technology, but I am deeply connected to Peggy Haslash, to Merlin Starr, to Kristen Mathis and that cat that keeps popping up, right? Like we are not disconnected. And yet we move through the world with our beautifully still colonized mind, believing somehow that we are 
separate, that we are not impacting one another on a polarity level. And I will avoid going into quantum physics right now. Let's invite some people up for some questions. Um, Laura, there's some already there that you would uh, like us to ask, or do you want to call out some names? If there is anyone who feels called to speak on camera, that's great. We've had some really incredible um, comments and people sharing their experiences, um, but I haven't seen a direct question. So if anyone has a question, you're welcome to raise your hand using the Zoom function or just um, wait for a little space and, and take yourself off mute. You can also type it in the chat. Yes, and let's allow a minute for the processors who are going to struggle with, should I come off of mute? Should I come off of mute? Should I come off of mute? Let's give them a minute. Amy Watke. Um, I'm curious. I just, um, I just went through an experience where, um, there, there was some unhappy experience on the other parties and they didn't communicate with me and then basically unloaded their unhappiness at the end kind of without offering like opportunity for communication, you know, sharing, unpacking or whatever. And I'm just wondering, is that like, is that like an experience of the colonialism sort of wrapped with privilege or something like what sort of that fall under? Kohat Net, yeah, do you want to take that one? I think I might need uh, just a little bit more clarity in terms of context. Can you can you give out a bit more definition? Um, um, I guess I feel sensitive about sharing more information. Um, okay. So, so let me just Basically, tell you what it's, I, it's like there. So there's two people, two parties involved, me and other okay. people. And then mm -hmm. there was an experience and mm -hmm. um, there was unhappiness during the experience mm -hmm. on the other people. Mm -hmm. right? And, um, and then I didn't know until the very end that there was any unhappiness at all. Okay. Then I got like, here was our, this is what happened, or this is how we feel, but with no, we, we don't want to talk about it, but blah. Okay. Good luck. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. So, I mean, you know, respect. Some people don't want to talk about it or whatever, but I'm just sort of like processing that and, and figuring like, what is that? <laughs> like, I'm like, what? Sure. Just like cold sure. excited me, you know? And then I'm like, well, let's talk about it. But they don't want to, clearly. So I can't be sure. all like, you know. <laughs> so th thank you for, for yeah. And I, and I appreciate, of course, and honored, you know, not being able to tell more details. I just wanted to get a better understanding um, and context. What I'm going to say is often the tough thing that, at times folks don't like to hear. And that is there are times and moments when something goes down, depending again, this, the context of this, I don't have all the details, but there are moments that things go down that depending where one way may land in the dynamic being spoken of, for example, if we were having, if I was doing an anti-racism, let's say workshop. And so the focus is, you know, BIPOC, and then it's also, right, folks that are racialized as European of European descent. And so we're having this conversation, something goes down, there may be a need to protect the BIPOC community in a way that means that I don't have to explain myself because I get to have that choice in a world that's constantly demanding me to explain or to teach or to school someone. And so I think that, and I often do this in my workshops and in my trainings, I let folks know, you have to understand my primary commitment is to my community. I am a Borinquen descendant. My first thing is to watch for the ways in which my community needs to express, right? And then protect that space. So I say that to say that sometimes in the tension of something, especially if it's a group, the group impacted by 
the harm that they have the power to decide whether or not they want to have a full grown conversation about that and actually lay that out or not. And so because I don't know the specifics, I can't particularly speak to that. But I think that as much as we'd like this very like general, which is what our socialized construct gives us, it's like everything's going to be super fair and that fairness and equalness are about both people being on the same, but this is not a one size fits all. This is not how this, this is not how this operates because you have to be able to evaluate all the pieces of what's happening, right? And so sometimes it is a little hard for folks to, when you wanna be in learning and processing of something, not to have access to that, but then I would invite you to go outside of that construct or that context and get the information and education that you may need to be better resourced for moments like that. Because what it's saying is that if we're talking about oppression, and this is the disconnect, this is why we're talking about decolonization. Because when we thought about it just as DEI work, well, sure, we're all colorful on the, the, the pamphlet. Wonderful, it looks like there's people included at the table, but we don't talk about power, we don't talk about policy, we don't talk about how that's a revolving chair, we don't talk about what it takes, the actual ecology, to keep someone who is diverse and, and different in the space. And because of that, we continue to address these things, trying to level everything out all the time. And that's not how that works. So the question that I would have in return for each person in this place, when we're thinking decolonization is such a, it's a macro thing. It's huge, but there are also micro components to it. They're in relationship. They don't work outside of each other. So I get that sometimes cognitive dissonance, beautiful term for what happens to your brain when it's feeling overloaded and overwhelmed with information that doesn't match exactly where it's located. So you get that brain fog thing and then you get that overwhelmed feeling like, what are we supposed to do? Yes, we get a colonization. What's next? Can you give us something practical? Well, here's the thing. You have to internalize the decolonization so that you understand what the questions then become and what the disruption becomes. There's no easy way for that. To learn to respond, you must learn why you react. To understand when you get into spaces where there's trainings and we're having these conversations, why does it feel like trauma for someone to say the way you behave and the way you move has actually caused me detrimental harm? And now I'm supposed to take care of you, though I've been the person that's harmed. Right. So when we start when we start cultivating the awareness, asking the questions of what we think is supposed to happen, what should happen? Shit is always dangerous, right? <laughs> All of these pieces. And we start asking ourselves how much of our reality is built on the necessity of people operating exactly how we think they should mm. in order for us to be present and exist. And so I'm going to stop right there because, you know, it's such a big, a big kind of thing. But I want to say for the most part, whenever I've done caucusing or whenever I'm in groups, I'm fiercely protective around how much emotional, physical, mental, and et cetera labor the people impacted by the harm have to do in order just to be in the present space. Yes. <laughs> no. Yes. Yes. But everybody write that down. How much of your day-to-day -day relationships with people or experience or space or whatever is predicated, was that the word you used? Go ahead, Ned. yeah. Or uh, dependent upon people, space, animals, uh, we're, we're an animal, but everything reacting the way you expected it to react, as opposed to being present and in relationship, which requires that there's no expectation going in. You're gonna get what you get. That is the relationship to embody that space presently. Ugh. Carmen? Just Carmen, did you have a question or a thought? Hi, guys. Hi. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I'm driving. I would love to see, be on camera, but I'm driving. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody that was on the panel and commenting. It was so insightful. I truly appreciate it. But um, three things that I wanted to talk about. Um, first of all, um, I think it was Rosalia. Am I saying her name correctly? I'm not sure. Um, she talked about, you know, the history being some, for some of us, the history is um, painful. And it's just, 
it's not a question. It's just more of a comment on this one. Um, I often think about like my family history and being black and, you know, I have long lineage on my, my mother's side and the women live fairly long. So my great grandma, fond memories of her, she was born in 1910. And then obviously her mother had to be born towards the end of slavery, 1865. Um, and we know nothing like, and I, you know, my great aunts are still alive. Um, they remember their grandmother. Unfortunately, I, my grandma did pass away, but she had Alzheimer's. So I never really had a chance to talk to her about it, but I spoke about it with my mom, about it to my mom. And she said, you know what, Carm? She said, we never really talked about it. Nobody talked about it. And she said, she thinks the reason why is just because it's too hurtful. It was too painful. But it just it just baffles me because the history is so rich and I would just love to know and share. Thank you so much. And learn from, you know, that background, um, you know, what what happened? How did they live? And not even just necessarily the bad thing, you know, their, their life, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so thank you, Rosalia, for pointing that out, you know, and mentioning that because I, I feel like it just rings so true for some of us. Um And then another comment, I'm not quite sure how to phrase my question, but just based on the whole topic of our discussion today, um, code switching. Mm. I mean, I, I don't know. (laughs) Obviously, excuse me. We have to speak correctly, quote unquote, professionally, quote unquote. But I often think about what if I really did go into the workplace and talk how I usually talk, you know, within my home, with my girlfriends, with certain colleagues that, you know, I am comfortable with. It just makes me wonder, I mean, I I, I don't, how does it all play into that? The, The code switching, I mean, do you feel like it definitely has been born from the colonial, colonialism, or is it truly just a professional thing? Mm. Can they be unwed from one another? You think, Carmen? Um, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I really, I love this, uh, this like, line of questioning. My mind goes to speak properly. Huh? That is. Oh God. Oh. That Can is you cool. hear me? Cause I'm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can you hear me? Because I'm I'm in root and I hope it's not breaking up. Can you guys hear me? It is, yes, a little bit. Yes, but we can hear you. It's coming in and out a little oh. bit. Uh, go ahead, Na. Yeah, and then Adria, do you want to go take this one? Yeah. So this is actually some of my favorite conversations. Um, yeah. Because uh, the word professionalism, I me words and I we have this really interesting relationship because as a poet. <laughs> I love that. (laughs) And as somebody committed to decolonialism, I understand the magic of breaking a word down and Mm. making a new one because the old one is not suitable. And so (laughs) professionalism in its origin was me was meaning to declare yourself at something, not put on a mask of something. Mm. Mm. So when we're looking at this, this idea, this language of professionalism, there are many things that are encoded into that behavior mm-hmm. and the metric of correctness was defined by whom. Mm. Yes. Now the, the layer underneath that is I'm going to bring my smart behind into the, <laughs> my new Eurekan smartness into the conversation. <laughs> bring it. This, this is usually when I start losing points in a space, right? <laughs> Um, not that I, not that I have a regard for the points, but I yeah. recognize that they're there. And <laughs> no here's points the thing. Lost. <laughs> English is such a poorly put together language comparative to anything else. And when mm. people say that you should speak English here in America, mm. Mm. First of all, English is not the language of origin to this island, large, massive island that we live on. And so the ways that we continue to perpetuate this idea of speaking correctly, well, what exactly does that mean? And who exactly Mm. does that represent? And why exactly is that even a conversation to have? Right. Right. So some of the busting I do on this is like, I I was born in in Brooklyn. 
Yeah. And <laughs> I still get people saying to me, you, you speak English so well. Oh, great. Mm. And I'm like, okay, all right. <laughs> get some coffee, get some coffee, pull up a chair. We got to have a conversation. Yeah, right? <laughs> let's talk. Let's chat, we gotta have a seriously. Conversation. But because- the piece that I do want to speak to, because I think this is an important piece, mm-hmm. is that how we have been coping is real. Mm, yeah. And it's because to be outside of that holds a real danger. It is not imagined. Yeah. It is dangerous for many mm-hmm. people to fully show up as themselves in an environment that is dependent on you following the rules. Yeah. So right? true. Yeah. So I'm I mean, your livelihood, this- your livelihood. Exactly. It's your workplace. <laughs> Absolutely. So when, yeah. like, when I'm doing, when I'm doing trainings, I let folks know we're going to, I'm going to, I'm about to expand your mind in all the dimensions yeah. and in all the ways. But yeah. I also want to remind you that we understand and my co-facilitator, we remind people, we understand that we're not going to pay your rent either. Right. Yeah. You see the radical chances that yeah. I have to take. I don't expect everybody to take because yeah. I have to live with the consequence. Right. Yeah. right? Yeah. So I want to honor that. I want to honor that we step into spaces and we need to do those things at times because yeah. we're doing the best we can because we have to pay the bill because ain't nobody mm-hmm. want to have to put, you know, figure out <laughs> you know, the vegetable okay. oil in the car as a substitute. Listen, I mean, <laughs> right? I literally have vivid memories of my mother. She's, she's, she was an educator, um, you know, and I, I, as a little girl, I would say, mom, like, why are you sound white when you talk to the, you know, to people right. that, you know, not family or whoever, somebody important. And she just said, mm-hmm. you know, and she broke it down, but I don't, yeah. I, I don't know. It's just, but thank you for that. I, I really very, I appreciate that response. So yeah, true. Absolutely. we just, it just bothers me a little bit. Like, you ha- I mean, you have to know when to turn it on and turn it off, but that's the world we live in. It's a part of it. So yes. And, and, and just one little thing before Yes, but here's the thing. This this is why I'm in this conversation is mm-hmm. because we need to talk about that while we have been doing what we need to do, the very thing that we need to do has continued to perpetuate and cultivate the fact that the dominant systems don't have to change. Mm. Yeah. So because true. we're we're going to compensate, you know, we're going to compensate for that by doing what we have to do. So there's mm-hmm. something about the demand of both. When my grandmother may her memory be a blessing, mm-hmm who's no longer mm-hmm. here, when I would go out mm-hmm. with my grandmother, she primarily spoke Spanish, first language, right? right? Born on the island. Mm-hmm. When mm-hmm. I spoke to my grandmother out in public, I spoke to my grandmother in Spanish. Yeah. And people around would feel incredibly uncomfortable. I trust that you figure out how to get your comfort back, but it ain't going to be at the stake of my grandmother because no. you're going to learn to build the capacity to hear us have a conversation in our language that is yes. native of origin. Or right? don't. You know, you don't, don't have to tune don't, in. Yeah. You don't have to tune in. I'm sorry. Right, right. I'm not even speaking to you. So that's right. like, I, I mean, right. I, and so I, I, say, I say that to encourage also the fact that uh, the importance about the disruption, but not yeah. at the cost of your dollar because I can't pay your rent. Thank you for yeah. all of you holding that space. Adrian, yeah, I know you I, want to I was just going to uh, add on to that. And, and I think you actually just said it that, um, in my own life, I've had to start with small experiments. Mm-hmm. Where could I uh, disrupt and uh, experiment with not sacrificing myself, not selling mm-hmm. myself? Mm-hmm. And uh, as I've done that, that circle has expanded. While mm-hmm. also, as we're naming here, naming uh, the, the very real privilege of being able to go, I've had that is the last racist manager I'm going to have. I'm going to go yeah. start my own company. Yeah. yeah. That is the last time within the context of this relationship that I'm going to have you question my experience of going through a grocery store. I'm going to go right. get a new relationship, right? There were yeah. small experiments that I had to start with as I finally made a decision. And to your point uh, of paying the paying the bills, paying the salary, yeah. It was a decision for me. I'm going to take the huge salary cut because cut. otherwise I'm just going to have to make it up in counseling cost anyway. So, right, <laughs> you know, uh, there was a, a moment there where I go, the money's going out anyway. How do I want to spend it in a better quality <laughs> life, a more yeah. fully self-expressed Lindsay yes. or 
do I want to be constantly giving this money to somebody else who is just treating the symptom of a larger problem? Yes. And so, uh, again, honoring that we, uh, I would never deign to tell somebody, just blow all the shit down. No, right? no. <laughs> What's a small experiment where you can go, not today, Satan, right? Like right yeah. here, <laughs> this is where I will not change my voice. I will not change yeah. my, no, you understood what I said. Did I blink? Yeah. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that we're seeing more and more of that. And that is why so many people are scared right now is that we're seeing more of that on a collective scale. Yeah. And, you know, just having this conversation also makes me, I've often thought it, but it brought to the surface for me, you know, Lindsay, you're familiar with my company, um, you know, and they do a great job of the DNI program and, I really feel like I really believe that they do truly work at trying to provide resources and to to do better, to improve and really hold up to the name of DE&I. You know, it's the work in progress, but it it makes me wonder, like, is it really genuine? Not just them, but I mean, overall with certain people and in certain situations, like, are you just doing this and just being nice or just acting this way because you kind of know you have to, in a sense, is it Mm. genuine? You know, the interactions, the, I I don't know. I I don't, I I don't know. That's a good, that's a deep question. And I don't know that I'm the only one to to answer it. So please jump in, Adria and Kohanet. Yeah. I think when we talk about social conditioning, there's an element of we are conditioned to participate within society. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think there is a rising level of shared consciousness that mm-hmm. the experiment is still in experimentation mm-hmm. and that um, There have been gains, but there have also been monumental losses yeah. get us to this point. Mm-hmm. And that we are starting to experiment with a different way of conditioning ourselves and our children to mm-hmm. fit into a society that we're starting to imagine could be better, could be yeah. less oppressive, could allow for more Uh, self-expression. We have the technology, we have the resources to end great suffering now. Right. And yet we're still trying, you know, this is why uh, I practice something called human potentialist or Mm -hmm. human potentialism. I believe Mm -hmm. in the potential that we're going to get there or at least better than we are. And so if you're asking me as somebody who has committed my life to this work and does this work every day, I would rather somebody who's going to fake it until they make it, Mm -hmm. right? Than Mm -hmm. somebody who doesn't show up at all. Yeah. I mean, and and fake it, you're practicing, you're trying in a sense, you know, and I agree with you, you know, I think we are getting there um, with the younger generations ahead of us. And I do, I think with the younger generations ahead of, ahead of us, and like you said, with the resources available now and the awareness that's happening, I think these kids, the next generation, it will be from a more genuine place yeah. because this is what they're learning and what they're growing up with, you know, and I don't say I'm not a pessimist. I'm really not. It just, it just, it's just a thought that comes in my mind, especially when we have some of the DE and I trainings. I'm like, You know, it's great. And I love to see the people participating in the (laughs) conversations that happen. But I'm like, do you really want to know this? Like, do you really want to learn it? Do you really want to put it into into practice? (laughs) Like, you know, is it really real? I don't know. Or is it just out of obligation? But I don't know. I mean, I I think authenticity is always a harder harder, uh, piece to measure in a world yeah. that demands performative type of behaviors. True. Mm-hmm. And I and I think I think the larger piece to that is that people for the most part, and this is why there's such a huge empowerment movement, right? Like we we have books for days, years, mm-hmm. centuries, maybe even around how to develop the internal person so that you're shiny and wonderful. Um, and so <laughs> part of part of these things is actually people learning to take 
Okay, so accountability is the ability to give an account. Responsibility is the ability to respond. And mm -hmm. so if we're if if we're conditioned toward a superficial existence, then mm -hmm. that question becomes really hard because most are not engaging in the ability to respond to their environments or their mm -hmm. lives or mm -hmm. the ability to give an account. So mm -hmm. our, and the underbelly of this is, is that the truth is that all these oppression structures, whether we're talking about mm -hmm. racism, sexism, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We all have much to lose because whiteness has been shaped in such a way that it's a non-culture. Mm -hmm. When there's mm -hmm. so many different groups of people inside of that culture and mm -hmm. inside of that, right, that frame, who also mm -hmm. have a people that you came from, who came from a land that had its own belief systems, who mm -hmm. came from a place that had its own struggles, that had its mm -hmm. own names and its own movement, and that has been lost in this very homogenous yeah. American mm -hmm. deal of what it means to be a human being. Mm -hmm. And so in order to get people from the superficial aspect of engagement, we got to mm -hmm. come to the underbelly of the emotional attachments and ancestral disconnection. Mm -hmm. Because once again, mm -hmm. you can't know what we're fighting for or what we're even talking about when you don't even have connection to your own, yeah. right? Yeah. And all of those things. And so this yeah. is part of the like, I can't help whether or not you're showing up authentically or not. This is what I know for sure. If you're stepping into a training space with me, we're going to yeah. drop in. We're going mm. to take a pause so that you can do a four count breath to help regulate your system. Cause I get you scared. Yeah. Say the wrong thing. <laughs> and yeah. and yeah. we are still going in this room. We're going to do this work and you can yeah. say what you want to say when you leave. But right now these are, this, this is the support system Respect that we're having space. in place. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause we're going to have to face it. If I have to face it, you're going to have to face it. <laughs> yeah, I can't run yes. from all the intersections of my Puerto Rican identity in this thing yeah. called America, right? <laughs> like, I can't run from it. I have to face it. So you must face then the part that you play in this, right? Yeah, feel what and I, I believe, feel. See what I say? Yeah. And so the, the yeah. best that we could do is trust that people at some point, what we started here is a seed. It's small. Yeah. It's very yeah. tiny. For some yeah. of us, we would see things in our lifetime, but we have to have the hope that the seeds that we're planting will produce of its own kind because we are living now, cleaning up the mess of the people before us. Uh, so sure. surely yeah. what you sow, you'll reap, right? Yeah, they have a mustard seed and it takes right. time. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> right. And so all of that to say that in these conversations, they do, we're asking great questions and, and they're, they're good questions in that way, although good and bad or binary that come from somewhere, right? <laughs> but, but the best that you all can do, that I all can do is to show up being yeah. willing to ask the questions of myself that I'm terrified to ask of others. Am I yeah. willing to examine my reality, the comfort of it, the, the convenience of it in the mm. mirror of saying that everything that I subscribe to impacts other people's because I don't live in isolation. Mm. I yeah. am accountable for my actions. I am accountable for my beliefs. Yeah. And so yep. when we start at that place, we start at a good place, but we also know have, have to know the boundary in the lane, your authenticity yeah. for you to begin to ask questions about and bring yourself yeah. to responsibility for, right? Yeah. And we get to go yeah. home and, you know, I don't know, eat something really delicious that our mother's made. My mother's <laughs> gone. But. Yeah. Oh, dreams. <laughs> yes. I mean, and Carmen, even just as we begin to close this space together, if we imagine that even for this moment, and I think it was uh, even better that you were on your car and off camera because we were able to enter into this space where it was Kohanet Ya, Adria, Daisy, me, you, and mm -hmm. we're in this little BIPOC space just talking about coaching one another, solving each other's yeah. hearts, rubbing mm -hmm. balm and oil <laughs> on one another. And you probably don't know that all these white people are sitting here watching it, right? <laughs> and you know, they've never seen this many black and brown women just have a conversation <laughs> all by themselves. A conversation. Yeah. Right? And, they, and talk <laughs> about things real and have to coach one another through this experience. And so yeah. let this be for today as we begin to leave this space just for you. This was your little experiment with asking what you needed to ask, of seeking what you needed to hear, of being coached in the way that you needed to be coached. And that is enough. Yes. Thank Bye, you everybody. Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. Happy November. Uh, please. Yeah.
prepare yourself and your family as we come to the end of uh, this month and we come together to uh, really marinate on the National Day of Mourning and what that means within the context of this country and this culture that is in the beginning stages of its decolonization. Adria, Kohanet, Ya, Daisy, thank you. Laura, our host, as always, an amazing show. See you next month. Thank you all, an honor and a pleasure. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks to Rosalea, who is now driving and bringing us with her. Um, everyone, you can head out on your own pace, no rush. There are thank few, you very much uh, for having me. Yes. Um, there are a few links that I put there that are being flooded by all of your love messages. So you'll get an email after this as well. But happy uh, Dia de los Muertos and uh, take care, everybody. <laughs>